It's the ninth lesson of the reading of To Kill a Mockingbird, in which we'll recap part one and then work our way through chapters 12, 13 and 14 of the novel. These lessons have been created for the grade 10 students of St. Patrick's CBC in Kimberley, South Africa. The video lessons are especially for those of my students who are still quarantined at home due to the coronavirus pandemic. If you are students or teachers watching these lessons from elsewhere, welcome. It's great to have you with us. This lesson is divided into four parts. My students have to complete a written recap of part one of the novel, chapters one to 11. This is followed with the reading of chapters 12 to 14. The written assessment requires you to provide a close textual analysis in response to one of five questions. This must be written on the provided page and will be marked using the rubric which I have included on the task sheet. You are being trained to cite textual evidence that most strongly supports an analysis of what the text says explicitly, as well as inference drawn from the text. Once you've completed that written assessment, we're going to read chapters 12 to 14 in your novel, starting on page 121 in the Heinemann edition. As we read, pay attention to these three points. Jem's increasing maturity. There's a widening gap between Jem and Scott he understands things that she cannot. Secondly, the passage where Calpurnia takes the children to a church service at first purchase, where the congregation is all black. Look for evidence of racism and prejudice, and watch out for any references to Tom Robinson and the trial, which is the focus for this, the second part of the novel. And thirdly, the role that Atticus's sister, Aunt Alexandra, plays in the second part of the novel. Let's start with chapter 12. As usual, I'll be skipping sections of the reading, not because they're unimportant, but simply to make up some time given the constraints that we have. Chapter 12 at the top of page 121. Jem was 12. He was difficult to live with, inconsistent, moody. His appetite was appalling and he told me so many times to stop pestering him. I consulted Atticus. Do you reckon he's got a tapeworm? Atticus said no, Jem was growing. I must be patient with him and disturb him as little as possible. And if, like me, you're a younger sibling, oh, that will sound so familiar, and so unfair. Skip 17 lines. The beginning of that summer boded well. Jem could do as he pleased and Calpurnia would do until Dill came. She seemed glad to see me when I appeared in the kitchen and by watching her I began to think there was some skill involved in being a girl. But summer came and Dill was not there. I received a letter and a snapshot from him. The letter said he had a new father, whose picture was enclosed, and he would have to stay in Meridian because they planned to build a fishing boat. His father was a lawyer like Atticus, only much younger. Dill's new father had a pleasant face, which made me glad Dill had captured him. But I was crushed. Dill concluded by saying he would love me forever and not to worry. He would come get me and marry me as soon as he got enough money together. So please write. By now you must be used to Dill's stories, his fibs. And in one of your questions at the beginning of this lesson, you were asked, why does Dill tell so many lies? And what does this tell us about his childhood, his background? 
and you're also asked to consider what role he plays as a character in this novel. Skip eight lines. As if that wasn't enough, the state legislature was called into emergency session and Atticus left us for two weeks. That's an important plot development because it means that the children are alone at home with Calpurnia. Go to the next page, page 123, 13 lines from the top of the page. Calpurnia has an idea. How would you and Mr. Jem like to come to church with me tomorrow? Really? Well, how about it? grinned Calpurnia. If Calpurnia had ever bathed me roughly before, it was nothing compared to her supervision of that Saturday night's routine. She made me soap all over twice, drew fresh water in the tub for each rinse. She stuck my head in the basin and washed it with octagon soap and Castile. She had trusted Jem for years, but that night she invaded his privacy and provoked an outburst. Can't anybody take a bath in this house without the whole family looking? And next morning she began earlier than usual to go over our clothes. When Calpurnia stayed overnight with us, she slept on a folding cot in the kitchen. That morning it was covered with our Sunday habiliments. She had put so much starch in my dress it came up like a tent when I sat down. She made me wear a petticoat and she wrapped a pink sash tightly around my waist. She went over my patent leather shoes with a cold biscuit until she saw her face in them. It's like we're going to Mardi Gras, said Jem. What's all this for, Cal? I don't want anybody saying I don't look after my children, she muttered. Mr. Jem, you absolutely can't wear that tie with that suit. It's green. What's the matter with that? It suits blue, can't you tell? He <laughs> he, I howled. Jem's colorblind. His face flushed angrily. But Calpurnia said, now you all quit that. You're going to go to first purchase with smiles on your faces. First Purchase African M.E. Church was in the quarters outside the southern town limits, across the old sawmill tracks. It was an ancient, paint-peeled frame building, the only church in Macon with a steeple and bell, called First Purchase because it was paid for from the first earnings of freed slaves. Negroes worshipped in it on Sundays, and white men gambled in it on weekdays. I have chosen to use the N-word there as it relates directly to the history of this church that Calpurnia attends. Remember the South, very racist part of the United States. They had slavery, and after the Civil War, when slaves were freed, Many of them gave money towards churches in recognition of that freedom. So First Purchase, a rather lovely name for the first church built for out of slave earnings. Skip 12 lines. When they saw Jem and me with Calpurnia, and the they there are the congregation members, the men stepped back and took off their hats. The women crossed their arms at their waists, weekday gestures of respectful attention. They parted and made a small pathway to the church door for us. Calpurnia walked between Jem and me, responding to the greetings of her brightly clad neighbours. "'What you up to, Miss Curl? said a voice behind us. Calpurnia's hands went to our shoulders and we stopped and looked around. Standing in the path behind us was a tall black woman. Her weight was on one leg. She rested her left elbow in the curve of her hip, pointing at us with upturned palm. She was bullet-headed with strange almond-shaped eyes, straight nose and an Indian bow mouth. She seemed seven feet high. I felt Calpurnia's hand dig into my shoulder. What do you want, Lula? I want to know why you're bringing white children to our church. There's my company. I thought her voice strange. She was talking like the rest of them. 
Yeah, and I reckon you's company at the Finch House during the week. A murmur ran through the crowd. Don't you fret, Calpurnia whispered to me, but the roses on her hat trembled indignantly. When Lula came up the pathway towards us, Calpurnia said, stop right there. Lula stopped, but she said, you ain't got no business bringing white children here. They've got their church. We've got our It's our church, ain't it, Miss Curl? It's the same God, ain't it? Jem said, let's go home, Curl. They don't want us here. I agreed. They didn't want us here. I sensed rather than saw that we were being advanced upon. They seemed to be drawing closer to us, but when I looked up at Calpurnia, there was amusement in her eyes. And when I looked down the pathway again, Lula was gone, and in her place was a solid mass of people. One of them stepped from the crowd. It was Zebo, the garbage collector. Mr. Jem, we're mighty glad to have you all here. Don't pay no attention to Lula. She's contentious because Reverend Sykes threatened to church her. She's a troublemaker from way back, got fancy ideas and haughty ways. We're mighty glad to have you all. And with that, Calpurnia led us to the church door where we were greeted by Reverend Sykes, who led us to the front pew. Of course, that passage tells us a lot about the prejudices in town. It's not just the prejudices of white against black. Lula represents the prejudices of, prejudices of black against white. Next page, one, two, six, second paragraph. Calpurnia motioned Jem and me to the end of the row and placed herself between us. She fished in her purse, drew out her handkerchief, and untied the hard wad of change in its corner. She gave a dime to me and a dime to Jem. We've got ours. You keep it. You're my company. Jem's face showed brief indecision on the ethics of withholding his own dime, but his innate courtesy won, and he shifted his dime to his pocket. I did likewise, with no qualms. Curl! Where are the hymn books? We don't have any. Well, how shh! Reverend Sykes was standing behind the pulpit, staring the congregation to silence. He was a short, stocky man in a black suit, black tie, white shirt, and a gold watch chain that glinted in the light from the frosted windows. Brethren and sisters, we are particularly glad to have company with us this morning. Mr. and Miss Finch, you all know their father. Now, before I begin, I will read some announcements. Reverend Sykes shuffled some papers, chose one, and held it at arm's length. The Missionary Society meets in the home of Sister Annette Reeves next Tuesday. Bring your sewing. You all know of Brother Tom Robinson's trouble. He has been a faithful member of First Purchase since he was a boy. The collection taken up today and for the next three Sundays will go to Helen, his wife, to help her out at home. I punched Jem. That's the Tom Atticus is if shh. I turned to Calpurnia, but was hushed before I opened my mouth. Subdued, I fixed my attention upon Reverend Sykes, who seemed to be waiting for me to settle down. Will the music superintendent lead us in the first hymn, he said. Zebo rose from his pew and walked down the centre aisle, stopping in front of us and facing the congregation. He was carrying a battered hymn book. He opened it and said, We'll sing number 273. This was too much for me. How are we going to sing if there ain't any hymn books? Hush, baby, you'll see in a minute. Zebo cleared his throat and read in a voice like the rumble of distant artillery. There's a land beyond the river. And miraculously, on pitch, a hundred voices sang out Zebo's words. The last syllable held to a husky hum was followed by Zebo saying, That we call the sweet forever. 
music again swirled around us. The last note lingered and Zebo met it with the next line. And we only reach that shore by faith's decree. The congregation hesitated. Zebo repeated the line carefully and it was sung. At the chorus, Zebo closed the book, a signal for the congregation to proceed without his help. On the dying notes of Jubilee, Zebo said, in that far off sweet forever, just beyond the shining river, line for line, voices followed in simple harmony until the hymn ended in a melancholy murmur. Turn to the next page, 128. Seven lines from the top of the page. Reverend Sykes closed his sermon. He stood beside a table in front of the pulpit and requested the morning offering, a proceeding that was strange to Jem and me. One by one, the congregation came forward and dropped nickels and dimes into a black enameled coffee can. Jem and I followed suit and received a soft thank you, thank you, as our dimes clinked. To our amazement, Reverend Sykes emptied the can onto the table and raked the coins into his hands. He straightened up and said, This is not enough. We must have ten dollars. The congregation stirred. You all know what it's for. Helen can't leave those children to work while Tom's in jail. If everybody gives one more dime, we'll have it. Alec, shut the doors. Nobody leaves here till we have ten dollars. The church was becoming stuffy and it occurred to me that Reverend Sykes intended to sweat the amount due out of his flock. Fans crackled, feet shuffled, tobacco chewers were in agony. Carlo Richardson, I haven't seen you up this aisle yet. A thin man in khaki pants came up the aisle and deposited a coin. The congregation murmured approval. Reverend Sykes then said, I want all of you with no children to make a sacrifice and give one more dime apiece. Then we'll have it. Slowly, painfully, the ten dollars was collected. The door was opened and the gust of warm air revived us. Zebo lined on Jordan's stormy banks and church was over. I wanted to stay and explore, but Calpurnia propelled me up the aisle ahead of her. At the church door, while she paused to talk with Zebo and his family, Jem and I chatted with Reverend Sykes. I was bursting with questions, but decided I would wait and let Calpurnia answer them. We were specially glad to have you all here, said Reverend Sykes. This church has no better friend than your daddy. My curiosity burst. Why were you all taking up collection for Tom Robinson's wife? Why oh, didn't you hear why? Helen's got three little uns and she can't go out to work. Oh, why can't she take them with her, Reverend? It was customary for field labourers with tiny children to deposit them in whatever shade there was while their parents work. worked. Usually the baby sat in the shade between two rows of cotton and those unable to sit were strapped papoose style on their mother's backs or resided in extra cotton bags. To tell you the truth, Miss Jean Louise, Helen is finding it hard to get work these days. When it's picking time, I don't think Mr. Link Dias will take her. Why not, Reverend? Before he could answer, I felt Calpurnia's hand on my shoulder. At its pressure, I said, we thank you for letting us come. Jem echoed me and we made our way homeward. Cal, I know Tom Robinson's in jail and he's done something awful, but why won't folks hire Helen? It's because of what folks say Tom has done. Folks aren't anxious to, to have anything to do with any of his family. But just what did he do, Cal? Old Mr. Bob Yule accused him of raping his girl and had him arrested and put in jail. 
Mr. Yule. Does he have anything to do with those Yules that come every first day of school and then go home? Why, Atticus said they were absolute trash. I never heard Atticus talk about folks the way he talked about the Yules. He said, yeah, those are the ones. Well, if everybody in Maycomb knows what kind of folks the Yules are, well, they'd be glad to hire Helen. Uh, what's rape, Cull? It's something you'll have to ask Mr. Finch about, she said. And for the first time, we get some information about Tom Robinson and the crime of which he is accused. Next page, 131, two thirds from the top of the page. Jem asks Calpurnia a question. Why don't you talk like the rest of them? The rest of who? The rest of the coloured folks, Cull, you talked like they did in church. That Calpurnia led a modest double life never dawned on me. The idea that she had a separate existence outside our household was a novel one to say nothing of her having command of two languages. Cull, why do you talk like that to the, to your folks when you know it's not right? <laughs> well, in the first place, I'm black. Well, that doesn't mean you have to talk that way when you know better. Calpurnia tilted her hat and scratched her head and then pressed her hat down carefully over her ears. Oh, it's right hard to say. Suppose you and Scott talked coloured folks talk at home. It would be out of place, wouldn't it? Now, what if I talked white folks talk at church and with my neighbours? They'd think I was putting on airs to beat Moses. But, Cull, you know better. It's not necessary to tell all you know. It's not ladylike in the second place. Folks don't like to have somebody around knowing more than they do. It aggravates them. You're not going to change any of them by talking right. They've got to want to learn themselves, and when they don't want to learn, there's nothing you can do but keep your mouth shut or talk their language. Cal, can I come to see you sometimes? Oh, see me, honey, you see me every day. Out to your house. Sometimes after work, Atticus can get me. Any time you want to, we'd be glad to have you. Now that exchange is important, especially for us here in South Africa. We call it code switching. When we adjust the type of English we speak, to suit a certain situation. And you'll notice that both Jem and Scott refer to their brand of English as the right English. That's not the case. Calpurnia's got it right. You code switch. You make sure that you speak and write and sound the way that it makes it easier for other people to access what you want to say so that they can understand you. So please don't let anybody tell you that you're speaking incorrectly. Educate them about code switching. And for the South African students watching, please go and have a look at that YouTube or TikTok clip that did the round some time ago about Woolworths water and what happens when you drink Woolworths water. We were on the sidewalk by the Radley place. Look on the porch yonder, James said. I looked over to the Radley place, expecting to see its phantom occupant sunning himself in the swing. The swing was empty. I mean our porch. I looked down the street, enamoured, upright, uncompromising. Aunt Alexandra was sitting in a rocking chair exactly as if she had sat there every day of her life. You'll remember Aunt Alexandra from Christmas at the Landing with Cousin Francis. Oh my, things aren't looking good for the children, are they? Remember the points that I asked you to look out for as we are reading. The first one, what evidence is there that Jem is growing up? I hope that you did highlight and annotate your passages as we were reading to find this evidence. I 
asked you to take particular note of what happens when the children go to church with Calpurnia. Please note what we learn about Calpurnia, that she's this whole rounded character. She's not just the housekeeper or maternal figure for the children. There's a whole lot more to her as well. Also the points about code switching, how she changes her dialect, accent and language and how prejudice is displayed in that passage. And then of course, very important is the reference to Tom Robinson. We discover that he will be on trial for raping, allegedly, Mayela Yule. Chapter 13 begins on page 132. Put my bag in the front bedroom, Calpurnia. Jean Louise, stop scratching your head. How's that for an opening line for a long term guest? Calpurnia picked up Auntie's heavy suitcase and opened the door. I'll take it, said Jem, and took it. I heard the suitcase hit the bedroom floor with a thump. The sound had a dull permanence about it. Have you come for a visit, Auntie? I asked. Aunt Alexandra's visits from the landing were rare and she travelled in state. She owned a bright green square Buick and a black chauffeur, both kept in an unhealthy state of tidiness. But today they were nowhere to be seen. Didn't your father tell you? Jem and I shook our heads. Probably he forgot. He's not in yet, is he? Oh, no, he doesn't usually get back till late afternoon. Well, your father and I decided it was time I came to stay with you for a while. For a while in Maker meant anything from three days to 30 years. Jem and I exchanged glances. Jem's growing up now and you are too. We decided that it would be best for you to have some feminine influence it won't be many years, Jean Louise, before you become interested in clothes and boys. I could have made several answers to this. Curl's a girl. It would be many years before I would be interested in boys and I would never be interested in clothes. But I kept quiet. Skip to the next page, page 134, eight lines from the top. The remainder of the afternoon went by in the gentle gloom that descends when relatives appear, but was dispelled when we heard a car turn in the driveway. It was Atticus, home from Montgomery. Jem, forgetting his dignity, ran with me to meet him. Jem seized his briefcase and bag. I jumped into his arms, felt his vague dry kiss and said, Do you bring me a book? Do you know Auntie's here? Jem sorry, Atticus, answered both questions in the affirmative. How do you like for her to come live with us? I said I would like it very much, which was a lie, but one must lie under certain circumstances and at all times when one can't do anything about them. We felt it was time you children needed... Well, it's like the scout... Your aunt is doing me a favour as well as you all. I can't stay here all day with you, and the summer's going to be a hot one. Yes, sir, I said, not understanding a word he said. I had an idea, however, that Aunt Alexandra's appearance on the scene was not so much Atticus's doing as hers. Auntie had a way of declaring what is best for the family, and I suppose her coming to live with us was in that category. Of course, when Atticus says to the children that the summer's going to be a hot one, he's not referring to the temperature. He's referring to the trouble that's going to come with Tom Robinson's court case. Seven lines. When she settled in with us and life resumed its daily pace, Aunt Alexandra seemed as if she had always lived with us. Now the next page, 135, 136 and 137, gives us some background into Aunt Alexandra's 
thinking and prejudices. These pages, these two and a half pages, tell us that she believes in old money, reputations, good folk, bad folk, and she is clearly of the opinion that the Finch family are good folk, and the Yules and people like that are the bad folk, and she does not want Scout and Jem to mix with so-called bad folk. Page 137, the last quarter of the page. Aunt Alexandra fitted into the world of Maycomb like a hand into a glove, but never into the world of Jem and me. I so often wondered how she could be Atticus's and Uncle Jack's sister that I revived half-remembered tales of changelings and mandrake roots that Jem had spun long ago. These were abstract speculations for the first month of her stay, as she had little to say to Jem or me, and we saw her only at meal times and at night before we went to bed. It was summer, and we were outdoors. Of course, some afternoons, when I would run inside for a drink of water, I would find the living room overrun with Maycomb ladies sipping, whispering, fanning, and I would be called, Jean Louise, come speak to these ladies. When I appeared in the doorway, Auntie would look as if she regretted her request. I was usually mud-splashed or covered with sand. Speak to your cousin Lily. Who? Your cousin, Lily Brook. She our cousin? I didn't know that. Aunt Alexandra managed to smile in a way that conveyed a gentle apology to Cousin Lily and firm disapproval to me. When Cousin Lily Brooke left, I knew I was in for it. It was a sad thing that my father had neglected to tell me about the Finch family, or to install any pride into his children. She summoned Jem, who sat warily on the sofa beside me. She left the room and returned with a purple-covered book on which Meditations of Joshua S. St. Clair was stamped in gold. Your cousin wrote this. He was a beautiful character. Oh, is this the cousin Joshua who's locked up for so long? How did you know about that? Oh, why, Atticus said he went round the bend at the university, said he tried to shoot the president, said cousin Joshua said he wasn't anything but a sewer inspector and tried to shoot him with an old flintlock pistol, only it just blew up in his hand. Atticus said it cost the family $500 to get him out of that one. That's all. We'll see about this. Before bedtime, I was in Jem's room trying to borrow a book when Atticus knocked and entered. He sat on the side of Jem's bed, looked at us soberly, and then he grinned. Uh, <clears throat> I don't exactly know how to say this. Well, just say it. Have we done something? Uh, no. I just want to explain to you that your Aunt Alexandra asked me, Son, you know you're a finch, don't you? Well, that's what I've been told. Atticus, what's the matter? I'm trying to tell you the facts of life. Oh, I know all that stuff. Your aunt has asked me to try and impress upon you and Jean Louise that you are not from run-of-the-mill people, that you are the product of several generations' gentle breeding, gentle breeding, and that you should try to live up to your name. She asked me to tell you you must try to behave like the little lady and gentleman that you are, she wants to talk to you about the family and what it's meant to make them county through the years, so you'll have some idea of who you are, so you might be moved to behave accordingly. Stunned, Jem and I looked at each other. Then at Atticus, whose collar seemed to worry him, we didn't speak to him. Presently, I picked up a comb from Jem's dress and ran its teeth along the edge. Stop that noise! His curtness stung me. The comb was midway in its journey and I banged it down. This was not my father. My father never thought these thoughts. 
My father never spoke so. Aunt Alexandra had put him up to this somehow. Through my tears, I saw James standing in a similar pool of isolation, his head cocked to one side. There was nowhere to go. But I turned to go and met Atticus's vest front. I buried my head in it and listened to the small internal noises that went on behind the light blue cloth, his watch ticking, the faint crackle of his starched shirt and the soft sound of his breathing. Your stomach's growling. I know it. You better take some soda. I will. Atticus, is, is all this behaving and stuff going to make things different? I mean, are you... Don't you worry about anything. It's not time to worry. When I heard that, I knew he had come back to us. The blood in my legs began to flow again, and I raised my head. You really want us to do all that? I can't remember everything finches are supposed to do. I don't want you to remember it. Forget it. And so Atticus does not bow down to Aunt Alexandra's wishes. You need to think to yourselves why Aunt Alexandra has come to stay. And although there's obviously friction between Alexandra and Atticus, she is there with Atticus's blessing. Why? The last chapter in this lesson is chapter 14. As we read through the chapter, I'd like you to take note of the following three points. The disease of prejudice and racism that seems to be gathering momentum in Maycomb. The fact that Aunt Alexandra suffers from the same disease and how the children are still trying to grow up and mature as the adults around them seem to be determined to succumb to this disease of racism and prejudice. Chapter 14. It starts on page 140, but we're going to start on page 141, four lines from the top of the page. What's rape? I asked Atticus one night. Atticus looked around from behind his paper. He was in his chair by the window. As we grew older, Gem and I thought it generous to allow Atticus 30 minutes to himself after supper. He sighed and said rape was carnal knowledge of a female by force and without consent. Well, if that's all it is, why did Calpurnia dry me up when I asked her what it was? What's that again? Well, I asked Calpurnia coming from church that day what it was, and she said ask you, but I forgot to, and now I'm asking you. Again? Please? I told him in detail about our trip to church with Calpurnia. Atticus seemed to enjoy it, but Aunt Alexandra, who was sitting in a corner quietly sewing, put down her embroidery and stared at us. You all were coming back from Calpurnia's church that Sunday? Yes, am She took us. Yes, am and she promised me I could come out to her house some afternoon, Atticus. I'll go next Sunday. If it's all right, can I? Cull said she'd come get me if you were off in the car. You may not. Aunt Alexandra said it. I wheeled around, startled, then turned back to Atticus in time to catch his swift glance at her. But it was too late. I said, I didn't ask you. For a big man, Atticus could get up and down from a chair faster than anyone I ever knew. He was on his feet. Apologize to your aunt. I didn't ask her. I asked you first, apologize to your aunt. I'm sorry, auntie. Now then, let's get this clear. You do as Calpurnia tells you. You do as I tell you. And as long as your aunt's in this house, you will do as she tells you. Understand? I understood, pondered a while, and concluded that the only way I could retire with a shred of dignity 
was to go to the bathroom where I stayed long enough to make them think I had to go. Returning, I lingered in the hall to hear a fierce discussion going on in the living room. Through the door, I could see Jem on the sofa with a football magazine in front of his face, his head turning as if its pages contained a live tennis match. You've got to do something about her. You've let things go on too long, Atticus, too long. I don't see any harm in letting her go out there. Cull would look after her there as well as she does here. Who was the her they were talking about? My heart sank me. I felt the starched walls of a pink cotton penitentiary closing in on me, and for the second time in my life I thought of running away, immediately. Atticus, it's all right to be soft-hearted, you're an easy man, but you have a daughter to think of, a daughter who's growing up. Well, that's what I am thinking of, and don't try to get around it. You've got to face it sooner or later, and it might as well be tonight. We don't need her now. Alexandra, Calpurnia's not leaving this house until she wants to. You may think otherwise, but I couldn't have got along without her all these years. She's a faithful member of this family, and you'll simply have to accept things the way they are. Besides, sister, I don't want you working your head off for us. You've no reason to do that. We still need Cull as much as we ever did. But Atticus, besides, I don't think the children have suffered one bit from her having brought them up. If anything, she's been harder on them in some ways than a mother would have been. She's never let them get away with anything. She's never indulged them the way most coloured nurses do. She tried to bring them up according to her lights, and Cull's lights are pretty good. And another thing, the children love her. I breathed again. It wasn't me, it was only Calpurnia they were talking about. Revived, I entered the living room. Atticus had retreated behind his newspaper, and Aunt Alexandra was worrying her embroidery. She was furious. This is followed by a conversation between, Attic, uh, between Jem and Scott, which quickly gets out of control, and the two children end up having an absolute brawl, which Atticus has to stop, and he separates the two children. Turn to page 144. The second paragraph. You ain't so high and mighty now, are you? I screamed, sailing in again. This is in the middle of the fight between brother and sister. He was still on the bed and I couldn't get a firm stance, so I threw myself at him as hard as I could, hitting, pulling, pinching, gouging. What had begun as a fist fight became a brawl. We were all still struggling when Atticus separated us. So clearly tensions are mounting in the Finch household, and you can imagine what Aunt Alexandra thought about Scout fighting, punching like this. Skip about eight lines. The children are eventually at peace with one another. James said, night, Scout, night, I murmured, picking my way across the room to turn on the light. As I passed the bed, I stepped on something warm, resilient, and rather smooth. It wasn't quite like hard rubber, and I had the sensation that it was alive. I also heard it move. I switched on the light and looked at the floor by the bed. Whatever I had stepped on was gone. I tapped on Jem's door. What? How does a snake feel? Or sort of rough, cold, dusty. Why? Well, I think there's one under my bed. Can you come look? Are you being funny? If you think I'm going to put my face down to a snake, you've got another thing coming. Hold on a minute. He went to the kitchen and fetched the broom. You better get up on the bed. You reckon it's really one? This was an occasion. Our house had no cellars. They were built on stone blocks a few feet above the ground and the entry of reptiles was not unknown, but wasn't commonplace. 
Miss Rachel Haverford's excuse for a glass of neat whiskey every morning was that she never got over the fright of finding a rattler coiled in her bedroom closet on her washing when she went to hang up her negligee. Jem made a tentative swipe under the bed. I looked over the foot to see if a snake would come out. None did. Jem made a deeper swipe. Do snakes grunt? It ain't a snake. It's somebody. Suddenly, a filthy brown package shot from under the bed. Jem raised the broom and missed Dill's head by an inch when it appeared. God almighty. We watched Dill emerge by degrees. He was a tight fit. He stood up and eased his shoulders, turned his feet in their ankle sockets, rubbed the back of his neck. Hey, Jem petitioned God again. I was speechless. I'm about to perish. Got anything to eat? In a dream, I went to the kitchen. I brought him back some milk and half a pan of cornbread left over from supper. Dill devoured it, chewing with his front teeth as was his custom. I finally found my voice. How'd you get here? By an involved route. And Dill explains to the children how he ran away from home. Turn to page 146. Halfway down, 16 lines from the top. He was worn out, dirty beyond belief, and home. Well, they must not know you here, said Jim. We'd know if they were looking for you. I think they're still searching all the picture shows in Meridian. Well, you ought to let your mother know where you are. You ought to let her know you're here. Dill's eyes flickered at Jim, and Jim looked at the floor. And then he rose and broke the remaining code of our childhood. He went out of the room and down the hall. Atticus, can you come here a minute, sir? I finally found my voice. It's okay, Dill. When he wants you to know something, he tells you. I mean, it's all right. You know he wouldn't bother you. You know you ain't scared of Atticus. I'm not scared, Dill muttered. Oh, just hungry, I'll bet. Atticus's voice had its usual pleasant dryness. Scott, we can do better than a pan of cold cornbread, can't we? You fill this fellow up when I get back. We'll see what can we we'll see what we can see. Oh, Mr. Finch, don't tell Aunt Rachel. Don't make me go back, please, sir. I'll run off again. Whoa, son, nobody's about to make you go anywhere but to bed pretty soon. I'm just going over to tell Miss Rachel you're here and ask her if you can spend the night with us. You'd like that, wouldn't you? And for goodness sake, put some of the county back where it belongs. The soil erosion is bad enough as it is. Oh, he's trying to be funny, I said. He means take a bath. See there? I told you he wouldn't bother you. Jem was standing in a corner of the room looking like the traitor he was. Dill, I had to tell him. You can't run 300 miles off without your mother knowing. We left him without a word. Dill ate and ate and ate. Skip seven lines. Dill made his way through the leftovers and was reaching for a can of pork and beans in the pantry when Miss Rachel's do Jesus went off in the hall. He shivered like a rabbit. He bore with fortitude her, wait till I get you home, your folks are out of their minds worrying, was quite calm during, that's all the Harris in you coming out, smiled at her, reckon you can stay one night, and returned the hug at long last bestowed upon him. Atticus pushed up his glasses and rubbed his face. Your father's tired, said Aunt Alexandra, her first words in hours, it seemed. She had been there, but I suppose struck dumb most of the time. You children, get to bed now. We left them in the dining room, Atticus still mopping his face. Oh, from rape to riot to runaways, we heard him chuckle. I wonder what the next two hours will bring. Skip 15 lines. The children are in bed. 
and Scout asked still, Why'd you do it? No answer. I said, Why'd you run off? Was he really hateful like you said? No. Didn't you all build that boat like you wrote you were gonna? Well, he just said we would. We never did. I raised up on my elbow, facing Dill's outline. It's no reason to run off. They don't get around to doing what they say they're going to do half the time. That wasn't it. He, they just wasn't interested in me. And this was the weirdest reason for flight I had ever heard. How come? Well, they stayed gone all the time. And when they were home, even they'd get off in the room by themselves. Well, what they do in there? Nothing, just sitting and reading. But they didn't want me with them. And the next two pages is the rather sad account of Dill's feeling like a third wheel in his mum's new marriage, his, her new relationship. So he'd rather run away to where he's wanted. Let's go to the end of the chapter on page 155 lines from the end of that chapter. Dill, hmm? Why do you reckon Boo Radley's never run off? Well, maybe he doesn't have anywhere to run off to. And with that rather poignant sentence, we end this chapter. As you know, I asked you to look at the development of the theme of prejudice and racism in this chapter. So have a look at these points and make sure that your notes and the text have been annotated in detail. You heard Aunt Alexandra absolutely horrified that Scott was going to Calpurnia's church and planning a visit to Calpurnia's home, which obviously shows Alexandra's prejudice and racism. Think about the many, many layers of prejudice and racism that are on display in this novel. Jem's increasing maturity is causing some conflict and bewilderment between himself and his sister. And in this last chapter, both Dill and Scout look upon Jem as a traitor when he splits on them and goes to tell Atticus that Dill has run away to the home. You know, of course, that Jem has done the right thing, the responsible thing. But in terms of the playground code of brotherhood and conduct, that's a no-no. You don't tell on a friend to an adult. So the separation of the ways is important. It's a very important plot development. Um, please take note of this. Um, Scott struggles and it's part of the reason why she is the narrator of the novel. So as you look at Jem growing older and more mature in his thoughts and actions, continue to think why Scott is the narrator and not Jem. What does she bring to the telling of the story that Jem can't bring because of his age? Here are your five review questions for these three chapters. Please answer them in as much detail as you possibly can, remembering to P your answers. Make your point, provide evidence in the form of quotes from these chapters, and then explain how that evidence proves your point. Remember, we are preparing for the final exams, which are coming along at a rapid rate. I think we've got, what, four or five weeks before we write our end of year examinations. And that's the end of this lesson. If you have any questions, you know how to get hold of me, especially my own students via Edmodo. Um, if you're not one of my students, then feel free to drop an email with any questions to the address that you see on the screen here. Until the next lesson, goodbye.